Funny thing happened last night. It wasn't really funny, but interesting thing. Uh, as I was tucking my daughter in, and she's 14, just turned 14 last week. Um, and if, what's that? <laughs> and she's still, well, this is what I was going to say. Tucking, the tucking in thing is not, hasn't happened for a while. But for some reason last night, she said, come talk to me while she's lying in bed. She was having somewhat of an emotional day. And, uh, so, you know, we're sitting in the dark, I'm talking to her, she's tucking her in. And she was asking me about something, and then she said, you know, you don't seem to be the kind of person who just lets your emotions show. So here I am at 11.30 last night getting therapeutic advice from my 14-year-old. That's what you get for having two women in the <laughs> count, count, count the two dogs that we have, which are also female. I am tragically outnumbered. <laughs> but it's good for me. I know it is. Uh, so... So I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? You've, you've seen me happy, you've seen me sad, you've seen me angry. She goes, yeah, but it never seems to be just like all out. It's like you, you always seem to be holding something back. And I said, well, what I've learned, I said, your memory scant, because there were some years when that was not the case. <laughs> but what I've learned over time is that for me, you know, it's, it's okay to be kind of in the center, if you will, about things. So today, Reverend Jennifer asked me to speak because we're starting our fall book study series on the endless practice. And I said to her, well, you know, we're starting this, uh, this fall book study, it's a new series, I would thought you would want to <coughs> set it off. She goes, no. She goes, there's not a lot of things I've seen you passionate about, but you're passionate about this author and his works. So you're going to speak about it. I wish my daughter were here now. <laughs> so that she could see that I do have those moments. I do have those moments when there is something that, that, that grasps me and grasps my heart so much that I may not do cartwheels, but often I am... The phrase I want to use is stunned into sacred silence. Stunned into sacred silence. One, this is a confession Sunday. One of my, one of, one of, one of I, I, I don't want to use the phrase false. I'll use the phrase, one of the aspects of my personality that I'm constantly working on is this idea that I might have it all figured out. And the more that I think I have it figured out, the more I realize that I don't. There's one thing that helps me realize that I don't have it figured out. It's when I read the works of people like Mark Nepo, the author for a fall book study. Mark Nepo has this amazing ability to help me Question my certainty of things. Question my certainty of things. I think that when we get to a point where we stop questioning the certainty of things, we've stopped growing. We've closed ourselves off. So we question the certainty of things. Now you may say, well, if we question everything, when, when do we ever stop and, and lay hold of a belief of a one thing that we can you know, bank on, uh, rely on? They're not exactly the same question. We can have our beliefs. We can have our beliefs. But we've all had episodes in our life where our beliefs have been called to question. Our beliefs have been called to question. Some of us, for example, I'll speak for myself. Me, for example, I held a belief once that if I did my spiritual work, if I did all the things that, you know, they tell us to do in unity, those five basic principles, the, the, the 12 powers, the, 
If I did the spiritual work, all the meditation, meditate day, night, and in between, if I, if I did all those things, then my life would be free and void of the negativity, the trauma, the drama. Stuff would stop happening. <laughs> like I said, there was a, the thing I'm working on is thinking I got it all figured out, right? So, but what happens when some of us may do that? Me, me, what happened when I did that and stuff in life still kept happening caused me to question the belief. But thanks to a lot of the work that Mark Nepo has done, he's made me realize that my belief is not the end point. My belief is not a stake in the ground, a, a, a line in the sand. What my belief is simply is a compass in my hand that points the way and keeps me steady as I walk through the mess, the drama. As he puts it, the messy magnificence that is life. My belief and my, my faith does not prevent the messiness. What it does is it keeps me walking through the messiness. It's a whole new understanding of that, that part of the 23rd Psalm. You remember the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd? That one, I haven't said it in a long time, so. <laughs> but there's a part that says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Didn't say pitched my tent and lived there for a while. <laughs> Said I walked through it. And sometimes when we walk through the messiness in our life, when we walk through the emotional, financial, physical, mental hardships in our life, It can be dark. We can sometimes not see our way. But that's where our faith and our beliefs, that's where they help us out. They're, they're that compass, that, that, that inner tug, that, that, that thing that we can't put words to, that show us where's the next place to put our feet, what's the next step to take. And the faith truly is knowing that as we put one foot in front of the other, we will eventually get through that valley. We will get through that valley. The Endless Practice is the name of the book. The Endless Practice. What are we practicing for? What are we practicing for? The messy magnificence that is life. I always say, life would be perfect if people weren't involved. <laughs> but they are. Sorry, we are. I say they like I'm not one of them. We are. <laughs> we're, we're, we're involved. And what we know, and what we, what, we, what we strive to make you really get at the very fiber of your being is that at our core, we are divine. The very essence of us is unlimited abundance and perfection, timeless. But you know what? That's, that's clothed in the human form and the human psyche and the human emotions and the human attachments and the human history of our lives. And sometimes there's, seen, sometimes there's almost a schism. You know, if we're these perfect divine beings, why is it so hard? sometimes. Well, because we're human. Becoming who you were born to be is the subtitle of the book, The Endless Practice, Becoming Who You Were Born to Be. It's a little bit of a misleading subtitle, because when I first saw it, for me, I was in that, becoming who I was born to be. Well, who was I born to be? Minister? Was I born to be, you know, 
fill in the blank. What role was I supposed to be born to be when I first read this? But this is not what he's talking about. It's not what he's talking about when he says becoming who we were born to be. What he's talking about is our purpose, not the roles we think we were born to play. Because you know what? We can choose any role we want. We can choose any role in life we want. I don't believe that we were perchance, I'll, I'll throw the good religious word, predestined. I don't believe in this concept of predestination, that there was something our lives were prescripted on our souls before we were born. I don't believe that. But I believe if there's any purpose that we have is to discover the fullness and the depth of our true nature, which is God. That's what we're here to do, to discover that. The roles we play as we go through that, it's, it's of our choosing. And truly, when we, f- we choose the role, if you're going to choose a role, choose the one you're passionate about. Choose the one that makes you sing. Choose the one that, in spite or sometimes, yeah, because of sometimes, the messiness that it brings to you, you look forward to it even more. Yeah. Often people say they admire us for being ministers. You know why I'm a minister? Because in this job, there is never a dull day. Like seriously, there is never a boring day in ministry. No two days are ever the same. It's like, what surprises will befall us this week? I had to start changing that word to befall to what surprises will behold me this week? <laughs> because befall implies that, you know, it's like a something. No, 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 no. This is, this is why I'm here, because I like, I don't like to be bored. If there's, any, if there's anything, like I get bored, I'm out of there. I like to be engaged. And this is what I believe our purpose is, to fully engage ourselves and the depths and the core of who we are, and be fully engaged into this world. Fully engaged in this world. When I say fully engaged, I mean going in whole hog. Apologies to the vegetarians in the room. Going in whole hog. With our hearts wide open. And you know what, people? If there's anything we have trouble with in this life, it's walking in with our hearts wide open open. That's the biggest challenge we have, because we want to protect this heart. It's been bruised. I don't know if there's anyone in this room who hasn't had a bruised heart at some point in their life. It's been bruised. For some of us, it's been battered. For some of us, it's been beat down. And we want to stop it from feeling any more pain. But you know what they say, when we build a wall around our heart, all we're doing is imprisoning it. Our purpose is to walk in fully open-hearted so that when things in life happen, as they will, when they happen, we don't clench our hearts closed in fear. We open them even wider knowing that the love that emanates from our hearts is what will bring peace and harmony to the situations. Y'all are in luck today. I'm going to tell you my two favorite highlights of my life. Both in one talk. Usually I spread them out. <laughs> and today I was like, both these stories are great. I don't know which one to choose. And I was like, well, then don't. Tell them both. So if you don't see me speaking for a while, that's why, because I ran out of my good stories. Here's the first highlight of my life. Not the first highlight of my life. The first highlight story I want to share with you. When I was in college, this was my sophomore year, I believe. 1995, yeah. I was at Shenandoah University in Winchester, Virginia, about an hour west of here. I grew up in Barbados my entire life. And at 20 years old, the year I turned 20 was the year I started college here in Winchester. Massive culture shock, but I got over it. <laughs> I received a call one night. My father, who 
My parents are entrepreneurs. If I have an entrepreneurial spirit, I get it from my family. My, my mother and father, they, they own this little mom and pop corner grocery store. And I received a call that one night, that night, my mom called and said, something happened. Your father was attacked. So he was leaving the store late that night. He was attacked and robbed and beaten literally to within an inch of his life. He was in a coma for a few days. When he woke up out of the coma, he did not have any uh, recent memory recall. So he didn't recognize my, my brother, who was there at the time, my younger brother, who would have been maybe 10 at the time, 11. He didn't recognize my mother at first. Um, but, but my father was the kind of, Barbados is a very small island. You've heard the story of six degrees of separation. In Barbados, it's like two. <laughs> I, I kid you not, it is about two degrees of separation. Um, he, he was known, because he was, he, he was an entrepreneur, a businessman, he, he knew a lot of people who ran a lot of other businesses. People were, were shocked, there was a newspaper, they came to check on him. He was friends who he hadn't seen for years were showing up, and he was remembering who they were, he just wasn't having recent uh, memory recall, but, but that came back eventually. But what did not come back? What did not come back was the personality and the character of the man I knew as my father. What instead showed up, it's like, it's, it's, it's as though if, if the, the happiness, the joy, the generosity, the love that he was didn't wake back up. And what showed up was this angry, emotionally violent person. Not physically, but just emotionally violent. It was as if that night, the man we knew, his name is Gilbert, the man we knew was Gilbert Holder died and there was this other person standing there. And that was really weird. Because how do you see a person, but it's not the person? And some of, us exp some of us go through this, especially if we've got elderly parents who maybe suffer from dementia. We see the person, but it's not the person we know. That night changed our lives forever. That night made me question everything I believed about God. And this was before unity. But it made me question everything. But one of the things that didn't make me question when we talk about the faith that guides us through the valley, one of the things that didn't make me question, because for some reason I had picked this up along the way, don't know how, but I had this intrinsic knowing that when things happen, we grow from them. We grow from them. We can't go back and change it. It's pointless to wish this didn't happen. We grew from it. We grew from that messiness. And the growth itself was messy. My mother had to change her whole outlook on life. She was a person who loved to, let's just say, be in control. And it wasn't, that, it wasn't that incident that made her change that. It was what happened afterwards because uh, as part of his recovery, the doctor said to my father, you shouldn't be driving because there was, there was, he would get dizzy spells and stuff like that. You shouldn't be driving. So guess what my father did? He drove. <laughs> he drove a lot. And he realized, well, I'm not going to work, so I got plenty of time on my hands. So my mother hid the car keys from him, so he went to friends and borrowed their cars. And then after he crashed a few of those and people stopped lending him cars, he would still go find, he So my mother had to really let go. It was hard for me, because I wanted to drop out of school and move back home and help. My mother was like, that's not helping anyone. So for me, my growth point was just trusting. Just trusting that what was happening there was happening 
as it needed to happen. And at, this, at that point in my life, I had to make my education the priority. And that was tough. That was really, really tough. I would have gotten on a plane and flew home, except for the fact I was in college. I had no money, so I couldn't buy a plane ticket. My mother wasn't buying one for me, so I was kind of stuck here. <laughs> and sometimes that's what happens. We, 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 we're stuck. But you take that opportunity to, again, go deeper. Mark Nepo says, how we stay in relationship to the mysterious whole of life is what brings us alive and keeps us alive. How we stay in relationship to the whole of life. What is the whole of life? The whole of life is the highs, the lows, the petals on the rose, the thorns on the rose. Can't really have one without the other. All of this is what comes to us. We say we want just the rose without the thorns. But it's those thorns that take us deeper, I believe, than the petals, because we can sit and it looks beautiful. But it's the thorns, it is the pain sometimes that takes us deeper if we know that that's what it's there for. What are we practicing for? The wholeness of life. That's the wholeness of life. He also says this, to learn how to ask for what we need, only to practice accepting what we're given. That's our journey on earth. To learn how to ask for what we need and then to practice accepting what we're given. Often we ask the universe for stuff, for things. For, we ask the universe for opportunities. Whether we say it out loud or we're conscious about it, we ask the universe for opportunities. And then they come to us. And often we say, yeah, that's not what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> but, that's, but that's the thing. The thing is that every opportunity that comes to us in our life is that opportunity to practice becoming who we were born to be. Practice to become the fullness that our soul is. Practice to discover the fullness of God that we are. And sometimes there will be euphoric highs, and sometimes there'll be some, we wish that didn't happen in the moment, but that's the journey. That is the journey that we're on. I'll share with you my other highlight story which actually literally has to do with practicing. So I remember I said to Steve, that's my favorite instrument that I don't know how to play. I know how to play a few instruments. I just don't like practicing. And I was a music major. <laughs> You've seen the irony. When I was in, uh, in college, both undergrad and when I went to seminary, I became known as the person who could find the loopholes. Okay. If this ministry thing doesn't work out, I might, I might become a lawyer or some kind of nego negotiator. I always found the loopholes. So when I went to college as an undergrad, the, the, the requirement was you did a major instrument. This is the one that you would, you know, uh, learn in depth, practice through exams on for all four years. And then you did a minor instrument, which you did for only half the time. And these needed to be two different instruments, okay? So when I started college, however, the only instrument that I, that I was really any good at was piano. So my advisor said, well, you can do a voice minor. I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, it's only a minor instrument, but trust me, the grades would not be good. We've got to keep that GPA up, so that's not going to happen. So I sat down and I scoured the catalog, scoured the catalog. And you know what I realized? That classical piano and jazz piano... <laughs> We're technically two different instruments. <laughs> so I walk in and I say, here it is. She said, well, you can't do... I said, yes, I can. Because <laughs> in the catalog, it doesn't say that I can't. <laughs> well, it does now. <laughs> <laughs> but back then, it didn't. So 
I became a jazz piano minor. And, and back in Barbados in high school, I'd taken, I'd taken a few jazz piano lessons, so I had a scant knowledge of what was going on. But again, I didn't like to practice. And I had envisioned that jazz piano was like, you know, they, it looked so effortless. But it couldn't be more the opposite. The more, I, I've figured out in life the more effortless things actually take more practice and, and dedication up ahead to get to that point. So there were all these jazz scales I was supposed to learn. So I'm trying my best and really not into it. I'm not practicing. My poor jazz piano instructor is pulling his hair out to try to get me to practice more. It's not going well. But for some bizarre reason, even though I knew that to become a good jazz piano player I needed to practice and I was not practicing, I still had this like demented vision of you know, being a good jazz piano player on the side, and going to clubs and sitting in on bands and so on. Like, it was, it was demented, but it was there, okay? There was no logic connected to it. That didn't happen. That never happened. However, one, one, one day we're in Kansas City, it's many years later, we're there for seminary, Jennifer and I get an invitation or an opportunity to go see perform live Chick Corea. Do you know who Chick Corea is? All right, so let me fill in the rest of you. Chick Corea is arguably one of the greatest living jazz piano legends there is. And he goes way back. He got to start with Cab Calloway. He replaced Herbie Hancock in Miles Davis's band. He, he, he changed the genre of jazz piano playing. He was nominated for 59 Grammys and 120. I mean, the man is just a living legend. So we get the opportunity to go see him. Some mutual friends of ours couldn't go. They had tickets. We were front row. And he was doing an improv concert, which I came to figure out means that he had no idea what he was going to play until he sat down at the piano. But when you're a living legend, you can do that. And people will still show up for it. So here's Chick Corea, he's playing, and he's talking to the audience, and he says, you know, at some point, improvising is sort of like how an artist paints a picture. You know, you, the artist has an idea in their head of what they want to paint, but then when the brush actually starts to hit the paper and the colors are mixing in, it kind of takes on a life of its own, and you're allowing for the ride too. He said, so what I'd like to do now is to improvise a picture of someone. I want to invite someone on the stage to sit and I will improvise a portrait of them. And I don't know that we were quite clear what he was asking. We didn't quite get it. But I knew one thing. One of the living legends of jazz piano was asking someone on stage. <laughs> and I was gonna go. <laughs> so my hand shoots up in the air. Jennifer is sitting next to me. Shoot your hand down! <laughs> and I was like, Chick Corea just ask somebody on stage. Why would I not go? <laughs> so I go up. Somebody brings out a chair and sits it in the crook of the piano. And he takes a look at me, and he starts playing. And it's like, it's like a nice, laid-back, funky... It's like he saw my soul. And he starts doing this thing. Now, the interesting piece about this story is sitting next to Chick Corea, He's got a, a little table of some small percussion instruments, like a tambourine, some maracas, some claves. I don't know if he thought at some point he was going to play them, but you know, this was after intermission, and he'd not touched them yet. And they were sitting there. I was feeling a little adventurous. <laughs> <laughs> don't anticipate the end of the story. Just wait, <laughs> wait for it. So I was feeling adventurous. So he's playing. So I see these percussion instruments, and I said, well, this is my chance. Carpe diem, seize the opportunity. So I stood up, and I like, pointed to them and pointed to him as if to say, can I jam along with you? He totally misunderstood what I was saying. He thought I was asking to play piano with him. <laughs> so he scoots over and invites me to sit next to him. This is kind of the response that happened that night, too. Jaws dropped, there was a <gasps> collective gasp. I think maybe they thought it was like some homicidal maniac or something getting out of my seat. 
but I sit next to him. And at that moment, I regretted every hour I did not practice <laughs> my jazz piano. I don't regret much in life, but boy, was I filled with regret at that moment. But I sat next to him and I reached deep within the recesses of my brain to pull something out. And, I, and in the moment, I was you know what? This is Chick Corea. Whatever I do, he's going to make it sound good. <laughs> so I started plunking a few notes, and he plunked a few notes, and we were feeding off of each other. We played for maybe 30 seconds. <laughs> but it felt like 30 minutes. And we were done, and I stood up, and the place erupted into crazy applause. He was like, who's next? And about 80 hands shot up, because now everybody's like, oh, I want to do this now. And he's like, no, nobody's playing with me. We just, you know. But this is why we practice. Not just for those moments through the valley of the shadow of death, but we also practice for those moments when we might be standing on a mountaintop, exuberant. And we can be fully appreciative we can be fully in the moment with our hearts open going, for this, I was prepared. Becoming who we were born to be, we were born to be the full expression of the divine on the mountaintop, in the valleys, and everywhere in between. So I'm going to invite you guys, if you haven't yet, get this book. I don't make claims about things that are going to change your life, but... And I won't say if it doesn't change your life, you get a refund. I'm not going to say that either. That's, <laughs> that's a claim I'm not prepared to back up. But this book will change your life. Being in, 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 in a small group connection with other people as you share with an open heart about where this book takes you will change your life. This is not a small claim I'm making. I'm the kind of person who just looks, I, I don't, I'm not one of those like people who like are just gawking from celebrity. I'm just like, they're just people too. If I, if I was that kind of person, I would not have gotten on stage with Chick Corea but he's just people too. We're all just people. But some people have gone further and deeper and are willing to share the journey. This is what this is. We have five groups. There's a sign-up table outside. I'm going to invite you to go check out, see if there's a time that works for you. Even if there isn't a time that works for you, get the book. Oh, sorry, what? And Reverend Jennifer will be there to help you uh, sign up. Get the book. And here's the beautiful thing about this book. One more thing. It looks a little thick, right? But here's the way he writes. And I love the way he writes. He writes for a short attention span audience. And you think it is, because he writes his little vignettes are maybe two or three pages long. But then, but then, he says, here's a journal exercise. And here's something to discuss with a friend. And the discussion question isn't like, how's the weather today? No, it is, it is something that is going to challenge you to open your hearts. And when I say open your hearts, I am talking about getting to those places that you don't want to look at. The places that I would rather just keep in the dark corner. But you know what? That's not the whole of life. That's not the fullness of life, and that's not reaching the fullness of the divine that we are. I'll read this passage, and we'll end with this. Like it or not, life keeps engaging us, asking that we follow what is real until the light of the soul is drawn out from us and that we carry what is real until the depth of the world grounds us. And by real, I mean any moment meant face-to-face -face and heart-to-heart, without pretense, 
or illusion. When we can follow what moves us, we break open what is possible and the light of the soul spills out of us. How do we bring light to this dark world? We let it spill out of us. That's where the light's coming from, us. So I invite you for the next six weeks into this journey of the endless practice. I invite you to become who you were born to be. I invite you to let the light spill out. Namaste. Namaste.